Do you want a mic? Hello. Ah. Um, just to start off, I'll introduce myself. My name is Kat. I'm a strategic planner, uh, and this is Alvin. Alvin is executive creative director of um, Naga. Essentially, Alvin is the CEO of the creative work in an agency. But for those of you who are not familiar with how ad agencies are run, I thought I'd just give a quick um, breakdown of how it works. So we have the creative, obviously, the work that you guys see, the end product posters, um, jingles, etc. Then you have account servicing, which is a department that manages, manages relationships and money. And then there's the strategy department, usually the smallest, and we're basically the custodians of the business logic be behind our creative decisions. Uh, so today, the ones talking will be the strategist, and then my <laughs> co-lecturer, Alvin, who's taking a picture now. Uh, so today we'll be exploring a lot of the cultural uh, context behind ads in the 80s, as well as sort of the storytelling patterns that happens in the 90s, which Alvin will uh, largely take you through. Yeah. So the title of the lecture is A Simpler Age, and it's a question because we tend to have a very romantic idea of the past when we think about the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, uh, for myself personally, when I think about the 80s, I think of like trips to Subang Airport, and now when I look back at pictures of them, I'm kind of like floored by how <laughs> small they are and how intimate. Uh, I think of big hair and like all this, you know, uh, sleeveless shirts. It was probably the most visible, you know, musical movement we had back then. And then I think of like a &W, where probably most of our parents had their first, second or third dates. Uh, and of course, I don't know if you guys remember this, uh, the Commonwealth Games, where everybody somehow in some way was involved and we had all the jingles and stuff. But was it really a simpler age? I mean, was it all you know, wholesome values and was it all as simple as we think it is? So I, the objective of this lecture is really to explore and figure out, uh, when we look back at ads, what do they tell us that we may have missed when we remember the 80s and 90s? Yeah? And we use that because uh, advertising is that part of visual culture. So of course, uh, all around you, you're surrounded by visual culture and artifacts of that. And art does it in a more, kind of sincere way, uh, in the sense that advertising um, doesn't. Because advertising is essentially for persuasion, right? So we always want to make you feel good. There's always an agenda. So how advertising works as an artifact of visual culture is that we always have an agenda. So when we think about ads, we should always think about it in terms of what they may hint at. So they can't tell you the accurate representation of culture, but they can tell you what were some of the things that were permitted at that time. So advertising, one of the first things they can tell you is what is usually accepted so socially, right? And uh, this is probably the most uh, popular example. Perhaps some of you have seen it or some of you have not. But this is the very rare scene of a Malay couple openly drinking alcohol. And this tells you already that it was publicly accepted at the time. It was totally cool. Nobody was going to throw rocks at you. Um, <laughs> you know, but it also can tell you things accidentally or not, you know, or what's acceptable or what's not. So I don't know if many of you have seen this ad. It ran on the Amno building on a digital board. And it's actually by this little uh, unassuming ad uh, Australian agency. And uh, it's, they're just using their mascot, which is a wombat. And there's nothing more innocent than a wombat wearing a baju melayu trying to get into the groove of the celebrations. But it elicited so many calls because people misread it as a pig. So that I can tell you a little bit about uh, the kind of milieu that runs, right? If people don't respond well to pigs wearing baju melayu or assume that there is a pig out there uh, on the board. So, but at the same time, when I look at ads in the past, they also tell you a little bit more about gender. And I saw this in a Juanita ad in the 1980s, and it's for Imac. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Imac as a brand, but it's a cream hair removal. And the line is, you know, how can you be a woman if you shave like a man? And it has, when you think about it, it has nothing to do with the product at all. But, you know, you can tell you a lot of things in terms of like the simplicity or the simple understanding of gender is nowhere near the kind of complex discussions we're having today about it, right? And it can also suggest consumption patterns. So this is a women's magazine in 1983-84. So you see a cigarette ad, 
next to you know, a suite of baby products. And you can easily imagine a woman smoking while she's changing her baby's diaper. I mean, these are the sort of things that you will not see today. Uh, for us, uh, putting, where we put the ad is as important as what we say in the ad. So this can tell you a lot about what kind of consumptions that were happening at the time. So was it really a simpler age? Uh, some of the ads you saw were from the 60s. A few of them were qu quite from the 80s. Uh, so we'll just go and have a little throwback. The market was way simpler then, I have to say. So we had fewer products. So part of the achievement you automatically get when you advertise in the 80s was visibility. So you didn't have to spend too much time uh, deliberating what you wanted to say. So you would just say something like, if your detergent cleans really, really well, and you know, that's half the battle won. Uh, you could run a whole full page newspaper ad about a piggy bank that's, that looks like a camel, which is really something a little astounding if you're practicing <laughs> you're in advertising because that is it's just not big enough news today, <laughs> you know. Um, and if you were selling a rice cooker, you would probably put in quotation marks, it's special, but you don't have to really explain why it's special because you're selling the rice cooker. Uh, so what do we know? In 1981, that's when Mahadeh came in, uh, and he is the result of uh, all the artwork you see here today. And the first thing he did within nine months of coming into power was he introduced the Look East policy. What that meant was uh, this sort of veneration for Eastern culture, specifically Japanese culture, and how to emulate these kind of like um, quality of service and attitudes. Uh, but this just brought in a proliferation of Japanese brands into the market. And you'll see a lot of Japanese ads suddenly coming out. But all of them, interestingly, echo a lot of national agendas. So this is from Ajinomoto, and it smacks of the sort of early 20th century war propaganda kind of art, you know, where it's very utopian and uh, everybody's having a good time. But you can see from the font, it talks about how Ajinomoto understands your national vision. You want peace, you want etc. It's essentially echoing whatever Mahade had to say. And uh, this is the more hardworking kind of ad. Uh, Nissan, for example, just directly translated Look East, Pandang ke Timur, like completely directly, right? If you want a better car. Uh, but agendas were really uh, part of the ads. Uh, I'm just going to play you an ad for Proton Saga and just see how little uh, there's any mention or reference to the actual car. Sorry, one second. <coughs> this was when Proton was first launched. Any of you guys old enough to remember this ad? Anyone? Yeah, you're probably above 40, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when I was sitting with Kat Rahman in some cafe trying to figure out what to do, right? And this, this little um, commercial popped up and I felt really old because I remembered the jingle. I could sing it. It's embedded in my head, you know. the music too. It's very, it's got that Soviet feel going. If they don't get the sound right in about two minutes, I'm going to sing the jingle <laughs> <laughs> for you guys. I think you might have to. <laughs> ever, ever owned a Proton, Alvin? Yeah. Which one? 
Vera. Vera. It was mm. pretty good, right? The college car. First, first job a car. Yeah, I think we'll just play it from the laptop. You guys okay with the sound? You guys want to come closer? You want? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, do you want to put the mic by the by the laptop? Okay, okay check out if you remember the tune. <laughs> Proton Saga, Kejayaan Malaysia, right? You remember, right? Yeah. It's quite good. Yeah. This is when I heard him, like, oh my god, I'm, like, I'm singing the damn thing. <laughs> right? But uh, it, it, it'll sing about national pride, it will sing about how we've achieved our dreams, and then there's a lot of like, dramatic twists and turns where the proton goes you know, through water and stuff. So, um, very impressive. If you looked at the <laughs> communist propaganda videos <laughs> of the 60s, yeah. they look exactly the same. You know, it's the industrial revolution, yeah. people are happy, the nation is progressing. It's, it's very simple. Yeah. I think there's some Tron-like inspiration as well in the, uh, in the w art direction. Yeah. So they attempt to be futuristic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I feel like I'm doing a DVD commentary. <laughs> Then you this is an honest trailer version <laughs> of our... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, there you go. Dramatic swerves and turns. I've not seen this on the road myself. Oh, look at that. That's the Soviet bits, I think. Yeah, and then, yeah. And of course, you have the compulsory dry leaves when the car goes... <laughs> yeah. They still do it now, you know. The other thing I noticed about ads in the past... What right? is that, man? Yeah. Oh, those are Malaysian flags. The resolution is very bad. Yeah. But it's a trail of Malaysian flags following so the car. It's waterproof, right? <laughs> from, <laughs> from going through river, and you can handle bumps. So very good suspension. Okay, all right. So yeah, you can see it's the achievement of Malaysia. Nothing about car suspension, uh, all that trimmings don't have lah. But I think we can move on la Chitu. I think it's okay lah. Yeah, no worries. You guys can YouTube this at home if you guys are creating for more. You know. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure it out as we go along. So, um, 1983, we had the Malaysian Incorporated Policy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but essentially, it was about how uh, public service and private service had to be sort of synergistic uh, and performing at the same pace. Uh, Mahadeh was kind of obsessed with the idea of efficiency, especially for the civil service. And um, he wanted a lot more autonomy in terms of uh, what the Malaysians could deliver. Sorry? Yep. Oh, so I was going to show you an ad, but it's sort of missing right now, where it's Amana Saham National, and it has a quote about how the Malay race has to kind of create their own volition to move forward, and it's from the Quran. And I was going to talk a little bit about how you don't see a lot of the Arabic influences yet. The font was still like, you know, Times New Romanish. There was none of this temptation to use geometric influences, etc. And it just had a face of a really sad Malay man in the middle. But uh, there's, there's a small technical hiccup. Uh, in this, so I'll just move on forward. At the social level, in terms of the ads, I really wanted to find out what was going on with Zaitun. Are you guys familiar with Zaitun at all? Gunekan Tampa Waswas. So the line was, uh, use without uh, 
precaution. And I think when I Wikipedia the Arabic word was was, uh, I think it originally means the whispers of Satan. So you can use it without the whispers of Satan. And you will see that the ad runs uh, sort of very practically. It just has the product there. And then it just tells you that this is something that Zaitun came up with. And I was struck by how there was no, again, no overt references to Islam specifically. It didn't say that it was for Muslims or anything like that. It just said that it was pure and that the quality was good. And I suspect that this could be because it was competing against so many foreign brands and it wanted to give you quality assurance even though it was a locally made product. So you can see from the ad, which doesn't require sound, um, how, how Zaitun does the ad. Oh, cool. So what's really interesting about this ad is um, people weren't, they weren't wearing hijabs to talk about uh, Islamic uh, products yet. Instead, you see this kind of imagery of them going to factories, people packing things up, this, this suggestion that there's high quality, somebody in the lab looking at things. So it, it seemed more of a quality assurance kind of message. The only elements of Islam was when they said shukur or when they said suci, which is very interesting because uh, I distinctly remember growing up 80s and 90s, seeing a lot more overt Islamic uh, Zaitun ads. And I spent many nights, I assure you, looking for other ads, but I could only find these two. The brand now is discontinued, but you would see of a lot more Islamic influenced kind of iconography coming up in the campaign, in the f uh, future campaigns they had. Yeah. And it was also the time when you still had uh, beer ads running. Uh, I think they only banned alcohol ads like in 1995. Uh, but they stopped having the ads in Malay, so all the voiceovers were in English, and uh, they only had Chinese and Indian talent, of course. Uh, and I'll just play you one of the ads. Actually, one of the things that struck me about this age, right, is that the ads were quite long. I mean, like, they were running for about a minute each, which is sort of a luxury today. The idea of proposing a minute-long video is, is an extensive persuasion process internally. But here we do a lot of, in the 80s, there was a lot richer time spent on telling the story. Patrick Teo was doing the voice over for this. I think the line is, um, gives back what the day took away from you, and then gives a stout is good for you. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, talking to women, this story has not changed even today. Essentially, this is the same story we always tell, um, uh, except that I think during this age, you didn't have to put up too much pretense about how you tell the story. If you have product, men will come. Don't have product, man leaves you. But here you have the essence of that story kind of like illustrated quite well. <laughs> uh, and I thought this was a wonderful ad to show you guys about the kind of clean and pristine um, gender role and family role lines that were kind of drawn out from this ad. So it's a sewing machine ad. So that means the husband and the son has to look far away as possible from the, <laughs> the sewing machine. And it's purely the preoccupation of the mother and the daughter while the son and the father look on and go, ha, 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 so great and then he's carrying a little ball there, and the father's presumably reading the paper. So I just thought this was such a nice, pristine way of how people, I think, that was socially normal to assume in 80s households. Um, but really, there was a lot going on uh, in terms of the 80s that the ads don't really talk about. Actually, the 80s was a huge, huge era of 
so much change. We had the first middle class grow. We had uh, women beginning to work. Uh, we had uh, women, people enjoying materialism, right, over, over just uh, whatever agrarian kind of like societies they had before. So <laughs> there were a lot of, I was going to show you guys, a lot of um, magazine articles, a lot of soul searching in Juanita magazines, etc. Articles like, how can I be feminine and yet still succeed at work? You know, these were actual articles that were running in uh, Cloarga magazine, Juanita magazine in the 80s. You had um, articles where Pantang Larang Juanita, still, uh, you know, relevant today. So the Pantang Larang is not even, the taboo wasn't even like uh, anything crazy. It's like, is it true that I can't comb my hair and sing at night? You know, and these were things that like maybe their mothers said in the past, in the villages, and these were questions they had to face while going to work, while on their computers every day. So this complexity was very much alive at that time. Uh, and one thing that was influencing uh, part of the tensions was the Iranian Revolution. Uh, and this just happened right before the 80s. But what is done is it's inspired a whole new movement in past. So basically, when the Iranian Revolution happened, which is probably arguably the only revolution that's happened for spiritual reasons, not economical reasons, um, the uh, Party Islam Malaysia was basically inspired. They were like, wow, we need to change and we can no longer work together with AMNO. And this is when the dialogue with PAS changed. PAS was more about how anything, uh, they started doing more anti amno stuff. Uh, basically, anything that was AMNO related was probably bad for values. And uh, that's why we need to defend our values. And it's sort of this dialogue that PAS was pushing um, over the decade that the 90s sort of inherited. And AMNO had to ask themselves if they wanted to create general popularity, how do you balance this, right? So in the 1990s, one of the first things that happened that really impacted advertising was the Malaysian Advertising Code of Ethics uh, for uh, TV and radio, which was, which was largely the only uh, mediums that was happening at the time. And they had very, I'm sure, purposely uh, ambiguous uh, laws put in place. And one of them was, you know, you can't have excessively aspirational lifestyles being shown. So I'm assuming this could mean anything from looking too very materialistic or too wealthy, etc. And um, this was a lot to do with the brain work of our former information minister, uh, Muhammad Rahmat. And you can see him trying to grapple with this dialogue of managing uh, modern morality, right? When you see the kind of things that he was doing, this is really something a lot of people forget. But there was one time on live telecast, Mahadir, uh, sorry, uh, Muhammad Rahmat got them on stage, Awi and Serge, very much still like musical legends today, and cut their hair in public. He said, I will not air your music unless you let me cut your hair in public. Um, and this is based on the idea that you had long hair, you probably had loose morals or, or whatever. But this was, again, a political show of uh, power and influence and to show that Amno was taking charge of this moral quandary that Pass was pushing, right? And this was also the time, significantly, a lot of the image of the female body began to be policed. How we depict the female body uh, had very strict rules by the 90s. So basically, if this is the female body, we had to have uh, a neckline barrier, so you can no longer show belly buttons, etc. Uh, and then for skirts, they all had to be below the knee. So it's sort of like high school. Uh, you know, that's the kind of uh, rules you have to follow. And they had another ambiguous line. Anything that elicited impure thoughts was banned. And again, this would be what would be impure is purely uh, arbitrarily decided by the uh, censor. Right? And if anybody, if any one of you has ever sold deodorant, you would know that the pits are also no longer uh, visible. You cannot show the pits. This would be like a major crime. And <laughs> I'm just going to show you how Johnson's and Johnson's uh, wrapped their heads around this new rule. This is, by the way, Sophia Jane, actress of Swami East Street and dot dot dot, which has a lot of uh, sexual overtones, if any one of you have seen it. <laughs> and it's unfortunate the music cannot play because there's a lot of saxophone going on, a lot of like scintillating saxophone as she rubs herself with the uh, foam. Yeah, so you can see that a lot of the rules were complied, but I thought the genius was that Johnson & Johnson's casted Sophia Jane. Uh, to do this. So it's much more than just a woman uh, washing her shoulders. 
Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> so I also wanted to show you because um, of these new laws, one of the other laws that came into power, place was this idea that you cannot project too much foreign culture. And again, this is very ambiguous what foreign culture could mean, but I'm assuming a heavy metal, etc., would be a big no-no. Uh, but it also wanted you to show demonstrations of defending your culture. And uh, so just to, in contrast, for example, to a 1980s ad, uh, a Marlboro country ad that I was going to show would show you like a white cowboy uh, going through the hills and he's smoking and it has nothing to do with connecting with the local audience, right? But by the 90s, there was this huge celebration of all our Asian cultures in the ads. The China one. No, the, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but this is one of the larger, bigger budget ads that they ran, uh, where it's a bunch of Kung Fu masters on a boat and a bunch of Silat masters on a boat dramatically arriving at the beach. And, you know, so this was a wonderful big budget example of kind of the, the advertising, advertising work that's complying to the new laws of the 1990s. Again, quite a long one, about a minute or so. <laughs> but I guess we can skip it. Do you guys want to see the whole thing? OK, all right. At this point, you can also see that the role of the product is uh, slowly taking a backs, uh, going backstage and, and the sort of a richer uh, experience of just the storytelling. The brand is not too visible here yet. Beautifully shot too. And then you see Marlboro peak over there. So there's more focus on storytelling and more focus on brand by the 90s. Um, and this is correlated to the increasing sophistication of the market. So it was a new era of storytelling in a sense. So in the 80s, you saw a lot of product-driven ads where it was like detergent, cleans, buy it. And in the ideas it, it, uh, period, it became about like, why would you clean? Why would you choose this? And you would philosophize over a bit about it. Um, so, uh, and it also became a quest for personal identity. Uh, and I will have uh, Alvin explore that a little bit more because he has direct experience with the 90s and creating work in the 90s. All right, um, I joined the ad industry in, the, in um, 1994, March 10 to be exact. I remember the date because that was the date that I started to have no more life, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you work 26 hours a day, eight days a week and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I came, I came into the advertising force at a very interesting time. Um, and I never realized what exactly happened until um, we sat down together at the cafe to reflect on things. Um, as we entered the 90s, right, it was the beginning of an era where I think Malaysia was searching for their own identity, right? Um, there's this um, little, I don't know why the thing is so small, but anyway. Yeah. Um, there's this little um, thing that I learned from a university student, and they explained the difference between Iklan Chermin and Iklan Pontianak. Basically, it means um, mirror ads and um, vampire ads. 
Eclan Chermin is basically when you look at an ad, you see yourself reflected in the story and in the sentiments and the insights and you can relate to it and therefore you connect with it. A vampire ad is basically, you know where vampires live, right? They don't come out in broad daylight and go shopping down Jala Ampang. They will hide in the shadows and basically a vampire ad describes ads you don't understand, you don't relate to. And if you looked at all the stuff that was done in the 80s, because we were influenced by a lot of Western thought, Western um, way of um, advertising and speaking, um, we were in an era where if you had to speak English in an ad, you had to speak with a proper um, British accent or American accent. And we didn't celebrate how we spoke as a people. So I think to a large degree in the 80s, um, um, we were just going along with whatever influences that we have overseas. But as we reached the 90s, right, we were starting to look for our own identity. Yeah. Um, there's a commercial here that, that made a huge impact um, in Malaysia, and it opened the eyes of many Malaysians. Um, can you look for it? It's called Black Cat. Okay, this is a Thai ad, and it's strange I'm using a Thai ad as an example of our um, uh, looking for identity, but I'll just play it first. I wish you can hear the the sound because this is like a crazy, crazy, crazy ad. And it came out in the early 90s. And this ad had a big effect on Malaysia because like Malaysia, Thailand started to look for their own identity and expressions in the early 90s. And this was one of the ads that broke through the clutter because prior to this ad coming out, a lot of the stuff that we saw out of Thailand were like Malaysian ads. They're mainly universal, very Americana, very Western, right? Um, very glossy, very beautiful, um, and all the Thai people look handsome, they look like pan-Asians, they look like models, and suddenly you have a bunch of ugly guys stares, you know, starting to appear in an ad. Now this, this ad was the start of all the famous Thai ads, because I remember I had friends in Thailand who were in the ad industry, and they told me that after Black Cat came out, a lot of brands in Thailand started to go to agencies and say, I want to do a Black Cat. This was the benchmark for Thai advertising. It's so crazy. Um, and the only good looking guy there is the hero, lah, you know, but everyone else is just ugly. And ugly people means you have character and people start to recognize that, hey, this looked like my neighbor, this looked like my dad. Damn it, it looked like me, you know? Because 99% of the world looks like that, right? So suddenly there was an a, a self-awareness of what Thailand is about, Thai culture. And they were proud of their story. And when we saw this in Malaysia, it started to raise our own um, desire to look for our own identity. Because prior to that, the way we did ads were like copycats of Western countries. We were highly influenced by the West, right? So this is, yeah, this is crazy. You should go look it up. Black Cat, Thai ad. Sure, find it. It's like first thing you search, it'll pop up, right? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, can I go back to the slides? Yeah. Okay, so that's Black Cat. Oh, what is this? Huh? Uh, I think this is the Black Cat link, but we can move forward to the Yasmin, uh, the next okay, slide. Okay, the next yep. slide, okay. Yep. Um, in the early 90s was also the rise of this person that has become world famous, so famous that on the anniversary of her death, Google Doodle honored her. I don't know if you remember. Right? It was on Google. And I met the ECD of uh, Google Doodle two years ago in Mauritius. And the first thing he said to me when he found out that I was from Malaysia is, are you a fan of Yasmin Ahmad? So you, you imagine the ECD of Google Doodle knows Yasmin Ahmad, is a fan, watched all her movies, studied all her writings, and was just talking about Yasmin Ahmad, uh, how big an influence Yasmin Ahmad had on him. And he's like this 29-year-old guy from San Francisco, right? This was amazing. It was like, I was so proud of being Malaysian. Anyway, there was the rise of Yasmin Ahmad and this word that we've never heard before prior to her coming to the scene, this word called Malaysiana. And everything that we see in advertising is a reflection of our society. Malaysia was looking for its identity. We're looking for our voice. We're looking for our culture, the way we speak, the way we express ourselves, the way we look. It was a celebration of who we are truly, truly, truly. We were moving from Iklan Pontianak into Iklan Chermin. We may not have seen a lot of it in the 90s, but it began in the 90s. And if you looked at the 90s, what happened in society is you can see that there was a lot of Malaysian pride coming out. So there was a loss of, uh, actually there's a whole bunch of words missing. Huh? There's a loss of fake 
accents. No, people don't speak like Americans anymore or don't pretend to speak like Westerners. And they started to speak like Malaysians. You know, our English is just horrible, right? And sometimes we push it too far, right? Um, we, 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 had, we see the decrease of pan-Asian looking talents. If you wanted a Chinese guy, he has to look like a Chinese. If you wanted an Indian guy, he has to look like an Indian and so on and so forth, right? And then you have um, all these other things coming out and I think it was just mirroring what society was going through in the 90s, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then the other thing, right, that was really, really amazing that Yasmin did justice to the most neglected community of Malaysia, the Indians. She started to use Indian people as main talents. So you saw Indian actors outside of Guinness Stout ads for the first time in the 90s, which was really, really cool. And I'll show you one of them, one of her early works. I wish there was sound, yeah. Because this is this is sound driven. If you if you yeah, it's 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 brilliant. Go look it up, you know. Basically, she starts playing Indian music, and it goes tung 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 um, this, uh, wait, the, the elder brother comes into the scene, right? Changes the channel to rock and roll. It disrupts everything. And then the grandmother gets upset, takes an umbrella, hits him, and you have the Tamil movie sound, right? And he's like, oh, sorry, sorry. And he puts back, he puts the Indian music back. It's really cool. It was one of the, when we saw this, I remember when I saw this ad in, I think, 1996, I was just a junior art director. And I was mesmerized by the beauty of my people. Um, I was mesmerized that Yasmin Ahmad broke through the clutter and went against the grain. And even though I'm not Indian, I connected with this ad so much because I saw local culture being celebrated for the first time as a commercial. And I applauded it. And that was the, the time I became a fan of Yasmin Ahmad. And I was, yeah, all right. And there was another piece of ad. Um, I don't know what's next. Tunku Rahman, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this one was a controversial ad, the Madeka ad. Yeah, Tunku Abdul Rahman. Yeah. The little boy, I think. The, the little one Indian little boy. Indian boy. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain the story as we go along, right? This is, this is a historical um, film because it was the first time that a local brand, Patronas, had the courage to use an Indian boy for a Madeka ad. And this ad caused a lot of controversy. Yasmin Ahmad got flagged for it because there were questions asking like, why do you use an Indian person to represent the independence of this country? So you can see that racism was beginning to creep in and people were being vocal about it. And I remember that um, from people that know Yasmin Ahmad, it was incidents like that that made her struggle even more harder for what eventually became a political term called One Malaysia. She was One Malaysia before it was an empty slogan, right? Pardon the pun. Uh, pardon the, the truthfulness. I'm, I'm so going to get arrested, right? But it was a beautiful story. When I saw this after the masseuse, I was really, really inspired, because again she used um, the minority to represent the independence of a country. She did it again and again and again and again, and she was so outspoken and so adamant about um, trying to tell truthful things that reflected what our communities and society is all about. And that was the whole struggle of the 90s. And you could see that she was the one that made it very clear in her films and in her projects. And that's why we're very thankful for the existence of people like Yasmin Ahmad, right? She did so much for our country in um, planting these thoughts in our heads. Um, yeah, can you go back to the slides? Okay, that's one little Indian boy, yeah. Um, what does this reveal about Malaysia from the ads that we've seen? I think it's it's the era where we're really, really beginning to be proud as a nation, as a people. And, and our dear neighbours down the south, Singapore, was also celebrating the pride of being Singaporean. Um, around the mid-90s was the first time we heard of the word Singlish being promoted. Singlish is the celebration of the bastardization of English language by Singaporeans. And we, being more kiasu than Singapore, we started to coin our own language called Malinglish. I don't know if you remember that. It all came out in the 90s. And that's when we started to celebrate the, the word la in commercials. 
and how we spoke with Indian accents, Chinese accents, Malay accents, and so on and so forth. And it all happened in the 90s. So you can sense that all these things were being expressed because the sentiment of the people were looking for identity, were being proud of who we are. Uh, with, our, with our weirdness, with our bad English, with our, I don't know, all kinds of things, right? Okay? So, yeah. Okay, and then this is, um, I was trying to find something that um, some of my early work, because most of my work were done in the early 2000s onwards. So in the 90s, I don't remember if I did anything worthy of showcase, but this was one of my early uh, films for UOB. And influenced by Yasmin Ahmad, I also use Indian people as talent. So this is called Mutu Chetia. Um, it's kind of, okay, it's, it's again um, driven by sound, so forgive the silent movie treatment. He, he sings, right? It's almost like a musical ad. Yeah, it's about yeah. a Chetia guy who's, uh, who is um, affected by UOB's uh, deal. And he starts to start his own commercial to try and fight the bank and all that kind of stuff. Lah. So, yeah. Um, Alvin, you should share with them the results of the ad. Um, I think it was for cash loan or something. They ta they want their target was to get ten thousand people. We hit the target of forty thousand, half of which were Indian people. Yeah. So it was quite good. It was quite cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Back to the slides. Okay. So that's Muti Chetia. So I think also like towards the as we headed through the nineties towards the end of the nineties, we were also questioning our. We we're not only just questioning our our identity as a people. We were also looking at values. And as, the, as society gets more complex with the advent of the internet and everything and information is just at our fingertips, I think the world became a very complex place. It was like filled with information, new ideas, things that challenged us. And we were, I think a lot of people um, in the industry saw themselves as influencers and they started to have a conscience. Um, I think towards the end of the 90s, right, um, what Yasmin did for us through her work and through the sentiments of the people here on the streets. One of the things that Yasmin really did, i uh, give you a little um, insight into her kind of how she approached work. I remember I attended a talk by her um, when I was a junior director and she had this word that, that burned in my head. It's called be with the rakyat day. I checked it against her husband. Her husband said she's probably lying, but anyway. But she had this term called be with the rakyat day which basically means be with the people day. And she would go on the streets and, and try and take public transport and go to the marketplaces and go into the shops and the uh, cafes and whatnot, right, into the little nooks and corners of the city. And all she did was to eavesdrop on people's conversations. And she would pick up all these insights and stories and sentiments and conversations from the people because she really, really wanted to write stories that mirrored how people feel about things. And she would take all these influences and she would connect the dots and she would continue to tell stories like that. And that had a great influence on me too, because after that, I also had my view of the right day where I go out into the streets, where I sky from work every now and then, and I just sit among people. And to try to take it further, what I did in the um, 2000 onwards, or, or this is out of topic already, yeah, is to sit with homeless people, with HIV people, with the migrants, um, with people that is outside the confines of my friend zone, or whatever you call it. And we're just meeting different people to try and find what makes a human being tick in different societies, in different communities, and that reflected the way we started to think, and that reflected the way we started to communicate. And so it was really exciting time. Yasmin Ahmad is the one that opened our minds towards looking at society and be honest about what's happening. And I don't know what's in the next slide. Um, sorry? Oh, yeah, okay. Let's play that. Um, okay. okay. This piece of work, right, um, as an example of, okay, since it's silent, I can explain it. Yasmin Ahmad also taught me something. Um, she started to look at values, and she saw things that were not right in Malaysia, and she wanted to fix it. And one of the things that she did, and this is, I, I applaud her for that, this is the first time a television commercial um, used May 13 as a topic. May 13 is the racial riot um, and uh, between mainly the Chinese and Indians, for those of you who are not Malaysians. 
and it was a taboo subject because there was so much of racism that came out of this. This was the birth of this is the official birth of racism in Malaysia. Right? May 13 is a very very bad date in Malaysian history, 1969 if I'm not mistaken. And she had the courage to deal with this topic in the 90s. And that's like a leap forward, really. And again, it had a big impact on what we um, do as communicators. And we started to be a little bit more bolder, reflecting on society again. Because if you went to the coffee shops and you listened to people, people were talking about these kinds of issues. So as a person that has, uh, has, uh, uses mass media professionally, and we know that we have the power of influence, Everything that we absorb from people's conversations, we said, hey, you know what, we should make a stand. And we will find brands that would support these kinds of things. But we have to be very clever, because anytime you want to confront something that's very sensitive, you have, it's like walking on eggshells, right? You have to find a, a neutral way of telling a story and not preach to people, but give that thought into people's heads and let them figure things out themselves. Because you can't force people to believe in things, but you can influence people towards certain things, a uh, certain way of belief, and let them discover the, that, that uh, belief themselves. And that's what the ad industry was starting to move into towards the end of the 90s. You didn't see it a lot because it was very rare, but towards 2000 and moving forward, you see a lot of it happening already. All right? So, yeah, so ad started, yeah, sorry, we'll go back one slide. Uh, yeah. What's this, huh? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to read it, okay, because I, I lost my train of thought. It reflected our society being more opinionated on things that mattered to them. The key word is what mattered to people. And some work are beginning to make a stand on things like racism, reconciliation, domestic issues, and whatnot, whatnot, right? It was all Yasmin Aman. And yet, it, it's not just Yasmin Aman. I think she was the, she, she managed, the magic of Yasmin Aman for me in the 90s was she was able to draw in the sentiments of what people are really, really feeling on the streets. And, and she's not just mirroring um, what people were doing, but she was trying to identify what people were thinking about. And she articulated, articulated it well in her story. So, yeah. All right, so next. Oh, sorry, it's me. Okay, so the end. Um, so right now, moving past the 80s and the 90s into current times, I think we are in a very interesting crossroads. I'm going to go slightly out of topic, right? Um, we are at a very interesting crossroad because right now, I think there's a struggle in the ad industry. We know we, we have social listening tools right now because, you know, all the technology and stuff. But we also have what we call immersion, where we have the habit of going into societies and communities to listen to people. Now, ad industries are playing a very, very important role. I don't know if they realize it yet. Like some of the projects that I've been in, right, we go into the flats where the urban poor are and we spend an entire week with them just listening to what's happening in people's lives. I've been into communities where 70% of the residents are criminals, the mud rum pits, and we spoke to their parents and we were listening to them in a non-judgmental way. We've been into the Kongsi areas where there are 15,000 migrants trying to build a city or a town and we spend 24 to 48 hours just in their shacks and in their homes in their, in their shanty towns or whatever you call it, listening and, and listening to the pulse of what's happening in those communities. We've gone into HIV centers, we've gone into transgender places, we've gone into the homeless under the bridges um, um, throughout KL and, and we have conversations with people as they are jabbing themselves with drugs and all that kind of stuff. And one of the most interesting conversations I had with a person was I asked him, have you ever robbed somebody? She, he said, yeah. And we, this was under the bridge uh, in front of the train station and we were sitting with our legs dangling off the Klang River, right? And I was thinking like, damn it, this guy can just push me in and my wife wouldn't know what happened, right? She'd kill me if she find out, right? Um, I'll die anyway. So, um, and I asked him, have you robbed anybody? And he said, yes. I said, when? He said, a few hours ago. I asked him why. And he said, if you were in my shoes, you'd do the same. And and the ad industry, I don't know if we realize, we, we have come to an era where we have the power to take in the pulse of what's happening, transform it into a very positive energy, some, into very positive, and give it back to the people. Once upon a time, I think we tried to mirror the West, right? Not a bad thing, right? It's just a clash of values. And then later on, we moved to an era where we tried to mirror people. But now we're in an era where we try to 
make certain um, stand on certain principles. We cannot mirror society 100% anymore because society is going crazy. Let's say society is going into an area where there's bigotry and racism. Can you mirror that in your, in your, in your ads? You can't do that anymore. You have a social responsibility where you have the power of influence. It's from the Spider-Man line, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And a power of influence is a huge, huge, huge responsibility. And so we take all these sentiments in and we are influencers because we are storytellers. We can inceptionize people. We can plant thoughts into people's head. The, the, the ad industry, maybe for the first time in a long history, is beginning to have a conscience, which is not a bad thing. And we're beginning to question what is our value back to society because while we have all the tools and training and workshops to, to change behavioral patterns like buy brand X, don't buy brand Z. If I can use those tools and tell you don't be an asshole, just be a nicer guy. We can use it to fight pedophilia. We can use it to fight injustice. We can use it to fight whatever that is wrong in society. And that's where advertising is moving into. And you know what? Advertising is just, a, just the window to what's happening in society. If you look at Malaysia today, it is a wonderful place. Do you know why? You read all the bad news, obviously. But when things hit, when the shit hits the fan, a lot of people want to clean it. And you see the rise of people like Said Azmi. You see the people, you see the rise of a lot of these NGOs coming up. All this, and th this new term that I heard only last year, NGIs, non-governmental individuals, which Said Azmi is. You see the rise of consciousness, the rise of social responsibility, the rise of having an ownership of where our country is going. This spirit and um, the state of our society and everything is captured through the ads and you can get a hint and a, and, and a glimpse of what's really happening in people through the way we communicate. Maybe 5-6%, but hopefully later it will increase and increase. So anyway, um, yeah. So, yeah, I just said this, um, yeah. Um, I, I'll probably just play this um, stuff I did in the 2000s onwards, uh, just very quick one. I won't play the whole thing. This was a project that we did a couple of years ago where we did a social experiment and asked people to say racist things. Um, we did it with urbanites, and I wish we did it with rural people. And it, was a, it, was, it went viral. And it started a lot of conversations around the country about the topic of racism. Um, since this is very sound-based and there's no sound, there's no point playing it. But you can look it up. It's by Malay Mail Online, a Malaysian racist. Um, we interviewed 54 people. We used about 20 people in the film because the others were just boring. Um, but all, of all 54 people that we interviewed, only one guy said racist things. And that also, she thought that it was just a line for a, a, a fake movie that we were casting people for. And she apologized profusely for that after that. She wanted the money, right? So we'll go to the next one, yeah? What's next? Huh? I can't remember already. Oh, Malaysia Rani is the other one. Um, I wish there was sound. Huh? You want to show your Medica one, the latest one? Yeah, I'll... No, no forget this one. The Kuala Malaysia, forget. There's one called Malaysia Rani. Yeah, I think... In the next slide. Yeah. Okay, um, I need to explain this because, um, it, again, it's driven by music and narrative. This was a project that we are currently working on. It's called Dulu Pendatang Kini Penduduk. Um, for those of you who are not from Malaysia, we have a problem where some of us are labeled as immigrants. Even though I'm fifth generation Malaysian, I'm still an immigrant because I'm wrong color, wrong religion, wrong race. Um, so we did a project where we went out on the streets and we just asked about 150 people two questions. What generation Malaysian are you? And where do, where do your ancestors come from? All 150 people of all races knew that their ancestors came from another country. Basically, it's a migration of people. And if you want to take it further and do the genome project, you know we all come out of Africa, right? So it's a whole migration of people settling in different parts of the world and then picking up different pigmentations because of geography and climate and everything and then culture, language, religion. And now we think that we're all different. There's only one race on the planet. Race is fiction. There's no such thing as race. If you really look at biology, there's no such thing as race. It's just pigmentation, language, culture, behavioral patterns, ideologies, things that you pick up. 
but we all belong to one single race called the human race. And yet, it is such a sensitive issue these days, right? And Donald Trump ain't helping either, right? So, um, um, so this, this is, um, we turned this project into films. Uh, this is a very beautiful film about a lady who was born in Malaysia during um, Independence Day. And they named her Malaysia Rani. So it's a story about a girl named Malaysia. And yet, some, in the eyes of some people, she's an immigrant that deserves to go back to India. So if, when this film goes out and make into public space, it'll be very nice to tell the people, the, the ra more racist people, I said, you can't tell Malaysia to go back to India, right? She belongs here, right? So this is the story of, yeah. This is not out yet, so you like the second group that have seen it, because it's <laughs> top secret, right? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Penatang Penduduk. And maybe the last one, I don't know. What else is there? Uh, Medeka. Medeka, it's, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, get, I'll just rattle it off. Ah, uh, yeah. okay. Just play the, the, yeah. And this is the latest one um, that's, that's um, currently going viral, very thankfully. Again, it's another brand that believes in um, using the power of communication, the power of media to to address things that matter in our country right now. So I think I'm going to wrap it up by saying that um, Yasmin Ahmad and, uh, and, and how Malaysia was in the 90s opened up the doors to a lot of self-reflection. I'm going to share with you this little thing that I picked up in this university called Hyper Island, uh, basically a university that trains ad agencies and to drag them into the digital age. And so I took this course on social media. And strangely, they had this thing called the well of knowledge. And I found it very fascinating because it felt like church to me, not a social media course. And basically, he said, the way we perceive information, the way we judge things, um, there are four things. We retell, we review, we report, and we reflect. The problem why everything is breaking apart around the world is because 90% of humanity do not go to the depths of the well of knowledge. We do not go to the area where we, we, we reflect on things. So let's say, if, let's say if you had an abusive father, right? And how would you tell people about it? How would you express this experience of being an abused child? For example, this is a rough example. If you reported it, you would just tell your friends, my dad came home drunk and he beat my mom. That's reporting. Do you know my dad comes home drunk every night and beats my mom? That's reporting. Retelling is like same thing as reporting. My dad came home drunk, beat my mom, and that's how I live every day. Reviewing basically means you, you have judgments. My dad is an asshole. He's a bloody bastard. He comes home drunk every day. He's a loser. He's a piece of shit on the planet. And all he does is beats up my mom. That's reviewing. But none of us go into the area of reflection. And the reflection will call you to, will, will, will require you to think a lot deeper and it takes a lot more effort and it could be very painful, but it's very liberating. My dad has issues that he did not solve. He was a child, he was a victim of abuse when he was a kid. He never got away from that abuse and it still affects his mind and now he takes it out on my mom. Suddenly the story is different because it has texture, it has depth, it has reflection. And what Yasmin Ahmad has done for... Um, and what Yasmin Ama has done for the ad industry is she collected the sentiments of the nation that were beginning to go in the area of reflection, asking, who are we? What are we here for? What's wrong with society? What can we fix? And that was the beginning of more responsible um, um, advertising, I suppose. And you can see it happening. It's the beginning. It's still the beginning. I don't think we are near perfection yet, and I don't think we ever will be. But it's very, very interesting to see and reflect on things, what's really happening. And we are at a very, very interesting crossroads right now because there are the people that want to destroy and there are people who want to build. Now, who has the bigger share of voice will cause the tipping point to happen. So we can be a great country and a great society if we know how to reflect on things, things that are universal, things that are life-giving, things that connects people, that builds people up, that builds friendship. Like Abraham Lincoln said, right, the best way to kill an enemy is to make him your friend. And yet we're not doing that because we're not reflecting uh, about the problems that we have in society. We're not reflecting about the conflicts that we have. We're not reflecting on the differing ideologies. We're not questioning why there is crime. 
why there is injustice, why there is racism, why there is religious fundamentalism. And, and so we are not addressing the root of the problems. We're just fighting fire with fire. And that is what 2000 is all about. And Yasmin Ahmad has forced us, has uh, not inspired us to go into area of reflection. And, you can, and, and we are eternally grateful for her or for opening our eyes and realizing our purpose and our responsibilities. And we are using it as best we can to influence people into things that are more positive and life-giving. And that's the power of advertising and, and how advertising is reflecting the consciousness of our, uh, all of us as a people. Right? Okay. I think that kind of wraps it up. Okay, yeah. yeah? Um, so I think just to summarize the sort of journey that we've gone through, we went through the 80s where it was kind of an innocent communication uh, about the product. And in a lot of ways, we were pushing, I think as we're pushing sort of values uh, to consumers' faces. In the 90s, uh, there was more reflection. The idea of like trying to find latent messages to tell Malaysians to be receptive to. Uh, and then uh, today, I think it's even deeper soul searching about the higher moral role advertising can play. Um, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, Alvin is sort of um, the new generation after um, Yasmin and trying to push the envelope about the meaning behind advertising. Um, I can always bring in any other advertiser and we can always talk about uh, persuasion points or how to sell things or you know, uh, bring out 12 features but point out two in an ad and things like that. But uh, I just wanted to also highlight the kind of pioneering work people are doing where it's not this you know, almost counterintuitive push to do stories that mobilize people to do better things than just to consume more, which is often the, the you know, cynical idea of advertising. So thank you so much for uh, sitting through this very quiet uh, lecture. Uh, we, we wanted it, it to be a bit more uh, experiential and have music. But um, thank you again for, and if you guys have any questions, just uh, let us know. And if you'd like a list of the ads that were featured, uh, just uh, let me know and I'll give you guys a list. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Alvin, for your time. Would you guys like a Q&A? Any cues? Or yes, Ziad, my husband. <laughs> Sorry, just a quick question to Alvin. Um, you rightly mentioned that you know, advertisers, there's an there's a influence that you guys wield um, because, that, because of the fact that you work through mass media. But one thing I'm always curious is that if you're an advertiser, you're always working for a client. There's someone paying the bills. There's someone paying for the artwork that you're doing. And certainly they would want things to be depicted in a certain way, right? So how do you balance that tension between you wanting to tell your story, maybe sort of you know, have an outlet on your conscience, but at the same time having a corporate guy making the decision and you know, gives it, giving the green light on what goes and what doesn't? Um, there's, a, there's a formula that Google Doodle uses. You know Google, they have this ten, uh, um, the 10 commandments of Doodle. One of the things is don't do evil, right? They probably do evil, but you know, they just say it. Um, and the, the, and um, in, in a day and age uh, where the internet, and where, where, people, where people have so much influence and power because of social media, um, and all brands, they want um, their things to fly on the internet. They want engagement, they want shares, they want views, they want stuff to like have 10 million views and all that kind of stuff. They want people to start a journey that lead them to a hub where they can buy something. It's all about capitalism anyway, right? But Google Doodle came up with four formulas where they reflect, where they, where they test their work. Um, they said four things that will, and, and I'll answer your question after this. Um, the four things that will make things um, go viral is that number one, it has to entertain. Number two, it has to um, validate your beliefs. Number three, it has to, um, I can't remember. I can't remember the third one, but the last one is vanity. And, and vanity was very, very um, interesting because we sh everything that we share in social media is an act of vanity. We are kind of like narcissistic about ourselves. And everything that we share, what we don't know psychologically, we are trying to tell people, I am this kind of person. And if you like what I share, you are validating me as a human being. So it's all about vanity. So they will question, would, these, would my work make people feel good about themselves if they, sh they share it? Will my work entertain people? Will my work inspire people? Will my work, uh, knowledge, 
will my work teach you something, reveal to you about something that you, f you feel so excited about a discovery, you want to show off that discovery. Now, what, what that really means is that people will only share and engage in things that matter. The keyword is matter. Now, what Google Doodle has done is just um, social media behavioral patterns. But if you look a lot deeper, that's, what we, that's a conversation that we have with our clients. What matters to people? Fundamental things, love, marriage, relationships, affirmation. Um, in Malaysia, um, racial unity, um, you know, um, um, families coming together, I don't know. Basically, the human needs, it matters to people. And when we have this conversation with our clients, we say that if you want your thing to go viral, if you want people to engage with your brand and have brand love, you got to give them what matters, and then that's where we weave in things that are positive. Not everything that we do is fighting racism, injustice, gender inequality, God knows what, right? But sometimes, like for Teleco for, for DG, um, when they wanted to talk about their 4G network coverage, we say that, yeah, you know, you're like Maxis and Cellcom. Everybody says, widest, biggest, fastest, 4G, 5G, 6G, God knows what G, right? And then everybody have a horrible experience anyway, and then they'll bitch on it online, right? It's all, so we tell them that why we put, hu we put the human element into your technology. That means there must be a human reason why. So we created a campaign where we give you 4G because people need people. And we celebrated relationships. Like how a dad, how a daughter misses a dad when she does overtime all the time. So go home. Things, simple things like that. They don't change the planet, but it makes people think, why do I work so hard? Am I an alcohol uh, work alcoholic? Am I a workaholic? Um, am I bad in my time management? Um, am I putting the needs of my work above my family? That's also positive things. You know, it's not things that you fight injustice and all that stuff, but so advertising has a role to play to plant these kinds of things. Uh. So that's how we tell clients because, and it's a, a little bit selfish, we tell if you do things that matter, the build on relationships, because relationships matter to human beings, your work will fly. And they say, ha. Huh. So it's like being good is good for business. There's a bit of capitalism involved. Huh? But since you're going to put out work that sells your stuff, might, well, might as well sell something that's positive in humanity. And some clients are beginning to see that. And they say, okay, fine, let's try that. So that's a breakthrough for us. Huh? Yeah. A bit of selfishness, no, but you know. You have to navigate all that. <laughs>